Hello and welcome to this lecture on temperature in streams. This is the eighth lecture in the stream ecology course. Temperature is an incredibly important element of stream ecology and it has important implications for all sorts of things from erosion to organismal levels and community structure. So what we're going to do today is cover a lot of that uh, about what temperature can actually do in these stream environments. Again, just to remind you about where we are, I know that you're probably thinking, how much longer can this go on for? We have gone through a lot of these right now, and now we're dealing with temperature, uh, and ultimately we'll have just light left to do after this. Some objectives for today explain uh, why water is unusual. Basically, what I want you to be able to do is tell me again why water is such an unusual molecule, what makes it unusual, what are some of the, the properties that are unusual about it. I also want you to explain how temperature changes in streams. I know that's a pretty broad thing and it also seems kind of vague, but what I am going to show you are a number of ways in which temperature is, changes across streams in both time and spatial scale. Again, as you've already experienced, you know that streams are variable in temporal and spatial ways. And then I want you to talk about uh, how changes in temperature are likely to impact stream processes because the temperature has a really important impact on the way in which streams actually go about the day-to-day -day business of being a stream in a sense. And the reason that I have a picture here of a, of a otter swimming around, this is actually from the Amazon River, is I just want you to start to think about the differences now between say tropical and temperate and Arctic rivers. In a tropical river, you may think that temperature is more constant. That's probably a good, uh, uh, good sus suspicion. What you will not have are things, of course, like ice, uh, and, but you will have, based on our, our knowledge about things like the flood pulse concept, connections and differences in temperature across time. In a temperate system, it's going to be very different. We're going to have long periods of very, very cold weather that will ha also include ice and that the stream will actually be capped from the terrestrial system indirectly and directly. And then in Arctic systems, you're going to have the exception will be warm periods, right? So there's lots of ways in which that's going to change the ecology of those systems. So what I would do right now is I would think to yourself, how does temperature change in streams? So list a number of ways in which temperature changes in streams. And I'm going to provide the, a list of the ones I came up with. But you should start to think about this creatively as well. I have not put every possible way that temperature changes in streams but I put probably some of the big ones that I thought were important. One of the most obvious ones that I just mentioned in the prior one is season. Season has profound impact, right? So temperate streams have very, very differences, different uh, temperatures depending on the season. That's in part based on the latitude that they're at, right? And that depends then on how much energy they're receiving. But in addition to that, seasonality has a large role in things like trees. And because trees provide a lot of shade or not, right, if they're not there, they don't provide as much shade, seasonality is also going to play a role because it's going to change how plants impact uh, the incoming sunlight. Streams are also going to vary temporally, right? That seems sort of obvious. They're going to change across time. They're going to change by depth. Water is going to be warmed at the surface and tend to be cold at the bottom. And it will also be that groundwater usually comes in through the bottom and groundwater tends to be colder. So deeper waters will tend to be colder. There's a bunch of other ones in here that I thought about. Altitude is going to matter, right? If latitude matters, things like altitude will matter. Maturity is going to matter. So how mature the stream is. Is it an old stream or is it a brand new stream? Old streams will have more things like plants around them uh, and that will change the way in which uh, the stream warms and cools. Temperature is also going to be changed by organisms, organisms directly in, the, in a, a what we call natural uh, variation. And that that is that organisms, uh, non-humans basically, will modify the streams. Or you can think about humans. Humans modify the temperatures of streams all the time from things like uh, dams, which cause areas to, to pool and creates large areas for sunlight to impact and warm to power plant effluent and uh, power plants that cool systems and then expel that warmed water into streams, right? They also change by humans, change it by removing certain types of land cover. Maybe they remove a lot of trees. Uh, they may remove the rocks in a stream to go use them somewhere else, right? There's a lot of ways in which humans can modify these systems. 
Other ways that streams can be modified. Groundwater is going to have really important impacts on how streams have a, oh, the temperature of streams. And substrate. Clearly, if you go outside and you touch something in the middle of summer that's very dark, like asphalt, it hurts. Right? It's very, very hot. It can get extremely hot. Compare that to, say, uh, a bright white road, and what you'll find is that that heat is much lessened. Uh, and that's because a lot of that energy that's impacting that, that white zone is being reflected, whereas a dark zone or a black zone will absorb a lot of that, that heat energy. And the same thing is going to be true in the streams. Very dark rocks will absorb a lot of heat. Very light rocks will tend to reflect it. Very dark waters will tend to absorb heat better. Very light waters will tend to not uh, absorb it nearly as well. Something else that we have to disentangle is the idea of temperature or sunlight. Now, the fact that we have warm temperatures is related to the fact that we have a sun, right? And you can argue with me about whether things like the uh, internal heating of the Earth, which is done by radioactive decay, is also responsible. But the vast majority of what we're going to talk about is really temperature influenced by sunlight. So it's really a uh, sunlight driven process. But I've actually separated sunlight out from this lecture. I thought about combining the two into a temperature slash light lecture, but I wanted to talk about temperature as a property of the water. And then I wanted to deal with light separately from that. So when we deal with temperature, understand that it's deeply tied to light levels and light levels are gonna be deeply tied to uh, the sun, right? Cause that's where we get the vast majority of our energy. There is a small amount of sunlight that's reflected from the moon, if you wanna think about it that way. And there's a tiny amount of ra radiation that's provided by stars other than the sun. But again, it's teeny tiny relative to how much energy the sun is providing us. We are probably going to cover some of the same elements here as we do in the next lecture, and I'm just going to warn you about that. But if anything, it should reinforce the importance of those pieces. All right. So these systems, again, are driven by sunlight energy that changes the temperature of them. But we're going to disentangle them or try to disentangle them as much as is reasonable uh, for the moment to discuss temperature and then we'll deal uh, with sunlight. But I am going to try to explain to you why sunlight changes across seasons uh, and why that would have a that's going to have an impact on temperature in the next few slides the other thing i want to remind you about of course is that we often think of things like uh, temperature changing through seasons and that's a fine thing to do it's very helpful especially for us because we're in a temperate zone and much of what we have learned about streams is derived from temperate stream research and this comes with a caveat then. Our research is very heavily biased in favor of temperate streams. And that's because the vast majority of studies have been carried out in the United States and Europe. And for the moment, it will be the case that our, our research will be biased. If you're going into the literature now and you're reading modern papers on stream ecology, you'll see plenty of papers appearing from South America, from Africa. Uh, papers are starting to appear in India. This is a great sign. We're starting to get better spatial coverage. We're also starting to see, and I should say China in there as well, we're also starting to see science uh, uh, and the availability of funds for research appear globally, which means that developing nations are truly developing uh, and that this is becoming an avenue of places where people are learning about the systems they're in, in part to exploit them. Wonderful, right? This is a great sign. But for the moment, we are very biased in our view of the world, and it tends to be very focused on temperate regions. So be aware of that. If you're interested in other streams, I also want you to be aware that these are really interesting systems that have similar phenomena, but are not identical, and so deserve their own uh, appreciation. So if you're really interested in tropical streams, I'm no expert on that, and there's a lot of uh, modifications to the standard processes which I'm going to talk about because my understanding is primarily driven by things like temperate streams and to a smaller degree by arctic streams so I would recommend uh, that if th there are others that interest you that you spend time learning about them because there truly is amazing things outside of temperate streams Temperature in temperate zones, of course, changes across seasons. In most places, we can think of them as temperate. Now, it depends on what your view is, but the huge range of the Earth is a temperate region, right? The vast majority of temperate zone, however, is really uh, captured by uh, the northern hemisphere. Now, southern hemisphere has far less land mass in sort of a temperate band, and you can see that easily on this map. 
Why does temperature, though, change with season? Why don't we just have a constant seasonality across the Earth uh, and across uh, the or across the, the Earth uh, itself? And the answer for that is related to the way in which the Earth moves in space. Hopefully you know that the Earth rotates around the sun. One thing you may or may not know is the Earth is slightly off kilter when it's doing this. So it's not standing North Pole South in a very even line, but it's actually tilted slightly. And this means that as it rotates around the sun at certain periods of that rotation, the sunlight will impact one area more or less, right? So for instance, in the June solstice, the northern hemisphere, the sun will never set at the very northern tip of it because the Earth is tilted such that that will never occur. But in the December solstice, the sun will never rise in the northern hemisphere and vice versa, the southern hemisphere will never set because of that slight angle. And that means that warming is going to be different. So there are going to be periods when there is sunlight all the time and that means that the temperature is going to be able um, to, uh, the, a lot of energy is going to impact the stream, the temperature is going to be able to climb. And when there are periods where there is very little sunlight, right, there's going to be no warming available through uh, sunlight energy. All right. If you look at something along the middle of the Earth at the equator, you'll know that it's about 12-12 year round. There's almost no variation. And that makes sense because this tilt doesn't affect much at the equator. The other thing that's important about this is that energy comes in at an uneven level, right? So energy that impacts in different locations is going to be either absorbed or, or reflected. The more that, that that impact from the sun comes in at about a 90 degree angle to the surface of the earth, the more it will tend to be absorbed directly. There's other factors that will change this as well. But just think about the angle here. When something comes in at a very high angle, right? It has a very high likelihood of being reflected away uh, relative to when it's coming in at a 90 degree angle. So radiation and heat will change. In the Northern Hemisphere, when you are tilted away from the sun, right? And that angle of reflection causes a lot of the sunlight to be deflected out into space, then you'll tend to have uh, much less warming, your winter. When the Earth is positioned so that the Southern Hemisphere is in that type of rotation, then you will tend to have the opposite be true, that you'll tend to have this reflected away and you'll tend to have warming. The equatorial regions, by and large, are going to be the same sort of angle year round, and so you're going to get similar heating and cooling there. And it's going to be relatively strong all the time. So you're going to have nice, warm equatorial bands. This is not the only way the Earth heats. Understand that transfer of heat around the Earth is also very important for setting the, temp the surface temperature of the Earth but it is one of the important ways in which temperature uh, or energy is Im uh, impacted and brought into the Earth system. One thing that people often misunderstand is they think that this is related to the distance that the Earth is away from the sun, which wouldn't really make any sense because it's winter in one place and summer in another place. So that would mean that if winter is when you're far away, why would there be a summer period in the southern hemisphere, right? So in the northern hemisphere, it's winter, it's southern in the, in the, or it's summer in the southern hemisphere. It really has to do again with that angle, right? So it's the angle that, that actually causes that, not the distance. Space is not filled with anything. So, or I should say almost nothing. So when the sun's energy is traveling from the sun to the earth, it doesn't matter if there's millions of more kilometers between you and the sun. There's nothing to absorb that sunlight by and large. So it doesn't change how much sunlight's actually reaching us. Another question we might ask is why does the earth rotate? Why are there days on the earth? Why is it night at one part and day at another and then day at one part and night at the other? Why isn't it just all day on one side and all night on the other? Is it true that all planets just rotate? And the answer is they do not. Uh, there are planets, of course, that have day only on one side and night is continuous on the other side. There is no rotation. And this has really important impacts for how those planets heat, or I should say bodies, heavenly bodies, because there are lots of things other than planets that heat in this way as well. When light impacts then on the one side, it will heat the one side. And without an atmosphere, that energy isn't transferred. But even if there is an atmosphere, right, the other side of that planet is probably going to be relatively cold because it's very hard to distribute that heat unless it has a very, very thick atmosphere that can distribute that heat and has good circulation within itself. But 
heating a planet evenly when you're only cooking one side is very difficult. If you've ever used a broiler before and you stuck something into your oven and you set that thing on, you know that even though there's a lot of heat impacting the one side of, let's say, your, your I don't know, tacos, right? You might get really good cooking on that side, and on the other side, it can be completely uncooked because it's very hard to distribute that heat through that organic material very, very rapidly. And as a result of that differential heating, you get uh, you get energy being stored in one place and not distributed evenly. Given enough time, yes, the whole thing would, but it doesn't move that quickly. So why does the Earth rotate at all? Well, it turns out early in Earth's history, before there was any life, or if there was any life, it died at this point, there was a large impact. And when that impact occurred, it caused the Earth to start to spin because two things bounced into each other. In addition to that, it also created the material that formed the moon. Okay, and this, already you can see that we're getting distracted, right? We're losing, why are we talking about streams? Why are we talking about the formation of the moon? Well, this is going to be really important to us for a variety of reasons, but I want you to understand that that difference uh, in the rotation of the Earth is going to mean that streams all around the world are going to have uh, uh, the possibility for life, as opposed to if we only were warm on one side or only lit on one side, that's the only place things like plants could grow, right? So we actually can have plants grow all around the Earth because of our rotation. The moon is also really important as it acts like a shield. It spins around us, and as it does so, things that might impact the Earth frequently impact the moon long before they impact us, so it acts as a little guardian for us. And because we have this rotation and because we have this tilt, right, we're going to have differences in temperate zones especially, where we're going to have a spring, a summer, a fall, and a winter. And in spring, what's predominantly going to happen is plants will have lost all their leaves. So most plants that we deal with, which we're very concerned about, like trees that block a lot of sunlight in temperate zones, lose their leaves in the wintertime. And that means that sunlight can penetrate very easily through them. However, there's not as much sunlight power sort of so to speak in the spring as there will be in the summertime when the, the incidence of impact is is more uh, 90 degree like as a result of that in the springtime there's going to be lots of energy impacting the stream but the water will be relatively cold so this will be a great time for things like algal cells to grow because there is plenty of light coming in the waters are going to be relatively cool and organisms are going to be just starting to speed back up their metabolisms in the summertime, water levels are going to decline because of evaporation, right? The stream is going to go to a lower level and we're generally going to have less rain. Most of the sunlight is going to be captured long before it reaches many of these stream bodies. And then the little bit of sunlight that does escape is going to be pretty well filtered and it will have predominantly been used for photosynthesis already. Uh, and so there will be far less energy for the algaes to capture. So there will be far less algal growth. In addition to that, there's lots of organisms swimming around trying to eat you at that point. So things, the algae will start to, to slow down. In the fall, we're going to have a couple things happen. We're going to have far more rain generally. Sunlight, again, is going to start to penetrate through to the, the stream, although not as intensely as it did in the spring, because there's still going to be leaves in the way, but not as many, and they'll be, be uh, falling off the trees very shortly. And so you'll see another second burst of radiation, and you'll also see, as a result of that, things like more growth, and the temperature will decline uh, but it will be uh, partially modulated by the fact that there's uh, quite a bit of sunlight coming in still. In the winter months, there is still energy coming in and a lot, the vast majority of that energy will now be able to hit the or impact the stream itself. But uh, there may be other things that prevent the temperature of the stream from rising, not least of which there will be buffers to that, like big chunks of ice, right? The ice itself will actually limit how fast water can heat up. Things like snow and ice also are good at reflecting light. So much of that incidence may actually be deflected off of the surface of the stream long before it enters the stream body itself. The other thing to think about when we think about temperature is that we can also have daily changes, right? Because we have this rotation in the earth, we're gonna have changes in the way that temperature is in the stream. So at night, it's gonna be the coolest it will be, and during the day, it will be the warmest it's going to be, and predominantly after the sun is directly overhead, right? As soon as the sun is almost directly overhead, you're gonna have the greatest uh, in incidence of light, and that incidence of light is going to occur in the stream, and that's gonna cause it to heat, and then it's gonna to start to move down, and then the energy in that system is gonna to start to decline. 
So the temperature in, say, a, a stream is going to change. And that's going to be especially true in areas without any forestation. So look at this graph over here. Deforested streams, those open circles, will change pretty substantially. You can see that changes by about 4 centigrade. And the, the range there is quite considerable. At, a, at the middle of the day, you have a, basically a, another 4 centigrade range in temperature. So there's quite a bit of temperature variation in that stream. Compare that to a forested region. Temperature does indeed go up tends to be much smaller and the total range is much, much lower, right? So these have very, very distinct differences in the way that water temperature occurs. This is, means that organisms that change things like forestation or change things like the amount of light that enters into a stream through a variety of mechanisms are gonna have important impacts on the temperature of these streams. And the other thing to point out here is that streams do change in temperature and four centigrades a lot, but that's considerably lower than air temperature. Right in a daytime air temperatures, it's not uncommon to see shifts on the order of 10 to maybe even 15 centigrade. Right, that's a lot of variation. Uh, but water temperatures respond much, much, much more slowly than that. And think about why that is the case. Start to think about the properties of water. The other thing to think about is that waters do what's called stratify. There's a couple of reasons for this. One is that temperature is going to increase at the surface faster than it will at the bottom. Sunlight, as it enters the water, is going to tend to warm the surface of the water because it's going to impact the surface of the water and it will probably be absorbed, right? So it's going to be generally absorbed at the top faster than uh, it won't it won't just be evenly distributed throughout the entire water column. It will be absorbed at the top and then less and less will make it to the bottom. In small streams, this is going to have a pretty minimal impact for most of the running water where the water is mixed regularly. But if there are small pools that are cut off, then that will probably have a very obvious warm surface and a cooler bottom. And you can feel that just by sticking your foot in, right? Because it doesn't mix very fast. If you're in a large river or in a lake, and again, if we get into limnology, this would be true, then you'll get really nice what we call stratification, which is layers like what you see here. The top will tend to be very warm water. There will be a short zone where the water will change temperature very abruptly. And then there will be a bottom zone called a hypolimnion where the water is very, very cold. This tends to be the case in lakes. So we generally see this in lakes. But again, this does occur to some limited degree in streams as well, streams and streams and very large rivers as well. All right. A couple of things I do want you to appreciate. I know that this is not uh, again, this is stream ecology, not limnology, but I do want to think about stratification because it does occur, and I want you to think about why it occurs. And here in this picture, I've shown you that the hypolimnion, and I can guarantee this uh, if you go out to a lake, is about 4 centigrade. And why is a hypolimnion always at 4 centigrade? Why isn't it at 3 centigrade? Why isn't it at 0 centigrade? Why isn't it at 10 centigrade? Why does it always come down to 4 centigrade uh, when you get into the, the deepest zones? There are actually some principles about water that drive this. One of the important elements about this, of course, that I've already mentioned in this course, is that ice is less dense than water. Look at the right axis here, the y-axis, and you'll see that the density declines from liquid water to ice. And that occurs right at zero centigrade. There's also this very strange thing which happens to liquid water as it approaches zero centigrade, right? It forms this sort of parabolic curve. We actually need to zoom in on that, par that parabola to see what's going on here. So let's zoom in on that little tiny portion right there. And what you see is it's really a pretty curve, right? Really nice stuff. But you can see that the maximum density, water's maximum density occurs at four centigrade. And you might say, oh my gosh, look at how zoomed in you have to get, right? You're in the decimals here to actually see that effect. And you're right, this is a very small difference. And yet, this is a really important difference, right? Because it turns out that water is densest at four centigrade. So at the bottom of a very deep river or lake where there's a lot of pressure, it is much easier to have water approach four centigrade because the, the density of the water is gonna keep increasing until it reaches a maximum. But it can't begin to freeze at that point right and if it does try to freeze it would have to actually be less dense 
And so what you'll tend to see is that water will stick around four centigrade in the winter, and, and then it, unless it gets extremely cold, and then it will shift very rapidly to ice. But it's actually going to take quite a bit of energy to move it from that four centigrade to that ice. And this has to do with the fact that water forms those nice regular hydrogen bonds. All right. The other thing to note about this is that that four centigrade density, when it's at the highest level, is not frozen, right? It's still liquid. And it means that organisms can predict, in a sense, not that they necessarily know, but they can predict that if they go deeper, they, in a very, very deep situation, they will find water that is liquid, although it tends to be cold, but predictably cold and stable. All right, so this is gonna be really important in streams, uh, in temperate streams and Arctic streams. So if you go and measure the water temperature in streams in the middle of winter, you will find that they will tend to be very close to four centigrade. And that will be universally true in these very cold areas. It is only after ice starts to appear and these streams finally start to, to solidify that that temperature will decline. And that means that organisms in the winter time can expect to have their optima somewhere around four centigrade, right? Because in many of these temperate and Arctic zones, that's what you can expect to see at winter time. So let's return again to that hydrogen bond thing. Why does water become more dense and then less dense? Well, if you want to pack a lot of water together, in fact, right, you actually can't allow as many hydrogen bonds to form because what you can see on the left is that when you have hydrogen bonds form, they actually create zones that do not have anything in them. So here's a zone without any molecule in it. This means that this area, which could have had a molecule in it, is now taking up as much room as say a dense area like this one here, which has more per unit mass in there. And that means that ice has to be, because it's a regular ordered uh, solid, has to be less dense than water, which is a less organized uh, uh, state of nature or state, state of matter. Okay, so until you can manage to order it, then there's a period where it will, that greater disorder allows a higher density. And that turns out to be right at about four centigrade, which is really important for, for ensuring that things like ice float on top of the water. And this hydrogen bond thing, I wanna remind you again, it, the reason that it forms this nice ordered structure is because there's a slight bend in the water molecule. It's not just an oxygen with two hydrogen off evenly to the side. There's a cloud of electrons, or at least you can think about it that way, that's sitting here and sitting here, making sort of a Mickey Mouse-like shape, that is pushing down on those hydrogens. And as a result of that, there's a, a, a place where there is attraction, so there's a slight negative charge up in these locations, and that slight positive charge over here, and so you can get nice ordered uh, uh, attachments to other water molecules, okay? Why does that actually occur? Why doesn't it just form a nice linear molecule? CO2, it turns out, looks very much like this. Oops, let me draw it. Right, it, it does form a nice linear molecule. So why is H2O so different? Oxygen is a small atom, but one of the things that it has in it is a, is it is a, or I should say oxygen is small. Oxygen is a small atom and it is a very aggressive electron uh, receptor. It really wants high amounts of negative charge around it. And that means that small atoms like hydrogen, which are relatively weak and can both either lose or gain electrons fairly easily, can be manipulated by the oxygen. And so oxygen pushes very strongly on the hydrogens and it can, it can deform the shape of the molecule, right? And so oxygen ultimately creates this deformed shape that allows it to make these regular uh, hydrogen bonds. The other thing to think about here is we've talked a lot about impacts of energy. We talked a little bit now about the, some of the principles of water, but also think about the shape of a river. Some regions of a river are gonna be shaded. Some regions of the river are gonna be open. So in different locations, you may have areas that are well covered by trees and yet other areas that are white and open and might get lots and lots of sunlight. And that's also gonna have profound impacts on temperature. And if you're an organism that lives in a very 
cool temperature region, you may want to be in an area that has lots and lots of shading and not immediately downstream of an area with lots of open area. And if you're a fish, maybe you can move around, right? If the temperature goes up, you're uncomfortable, you move somewhere else. But if you're a little tiny bug, right, that's not really an option. And even if a fish moves around, you have to understand these are not smart animals. They don't sit around thinking to themselves, man, stream ecology is really interesting and I live in a stream. I should probably know a lot about that. They just move around, right? It's uncomfortable, they leave the area. It's not like they have a map in front of them saying if you swim 100 meters upstream, things will be better for you. You just have to swim in a direction and hope that something gets better. So whether you're actively in control of where you are in the water column or you have to you have to allow the, the water to, to push you around in the case of very small insects, it doesn't matter. You're going to have situations where you're gonna have differences in temperature and organisms may respond by moving around. But temperature is going to be extremely variable in a stream. As a result of that, uh, if you have very sensitive detectors, you'll easily be able to pick that up, right? There's going to be lots and lots of differences that you'll be able to find. It is important to remind you, though, that streams are relatively I mean, well-mixed systems that have lots of opportunity for water to recombine and mix around. And as a result of that, the water in a stream, although it may have differences, is often going to be similar to itself at a broad scale. Okay, so within a certain reach, it will be very similar. But as you zoom in on sort of microhabitats, you can find differences for sure. The other thing to keep in mind here is that the daily temperature range, right, is going to be different in different orders of streams. In huge bodies of water, the daily temperature cannot change much, right? So as you get into these very large rivers over on this end, the, the daily temperature range is going to be tiny. You simply can't warm or cool that much water very rapidly. The sweet spot tends to be in here, right, the three to five zone, where temperatures can change fairly rapidly because the streams are large enough to get lots of water that can be of different temperature, which can change them quickly but they're small enough so that there isn't so much water it can't change, right? As you get into these little water bodies, there's probably just one thing that's driving them or small numbers of things that are driving their temperatures. And so they tend to not respond nearly as quickly to those. I mentioned this earlier that altitude really matters. So as you go up, in altitude, temperature begins to cool. So if you want to study Arctic lakes, one of the, or Arctic streams, I should say, one of the places you can go is you can go, you can start to go into places like Canada, right? You can keep going north, or you can just go up a mountain, right? Go find a very tall mountain. In Maryland, we don't have really tall mountains, but we do have some mountainous zones. And so if you want to study uh, more temperate lakes or rivers, then you would go to the Appalachians. Uh, and there you would find lakes that tend to be more temperate than we find down on the coastal plain, for instance. But why does temperature change with latitude? Not latitude, sorry. Why does it change with altitude? Well, it turns out it's related to the pressure of the atmosphere, all right? So if you remember the ideal gas law, you can also know that something like PV over T is equal to PV over T. So the pressure and volume divided by temperature of a gas is related to the pressure and volume and the, over the temperature of that gas in a different location, right? So part of the answer is just simply that the pressure is lower, so temperature has to be lower as well. In addition to that, the heat that we actually get out in on the surface of the Earth is related to that incoming sunlight, but it's actually hard to hold on to because the Earth is like a little marble in, in this very cold thing that is space all around it. And so heat is constantly being lost out into space. And so when you're in very, very high altitudes, there's a couple of issues. One is you're closer to that actual uh, interface where the heat is being lost. But two is also there's a lot less matter in the air. There's a lot less stuff around you to hold on to energy. And so there's actually less ability to one, capture the energy coming from the sunlight and two, reflect and retain it onto the surface. So it's maybe not obvious to you when you go up into very high altitudes, but you're being bombarded by far less atoms per second, right? Because there's far fewer gaseous atoms around you. Right? They're much more spaced out in that sense. So there is a real difference in the temperature of high elevations, where it'll be very, very cool relative to what you get at very low elevations. Now, you have to go up thousands of meters right, to get these effects, but then they do really begin to accumulate. Another thing that we have to 
consider is that stream temperature is t closely tied to their maturity, right? Here is a very young stream. This stream is being built. Right? This is a generated stream. But you can see that the temperature that this stream is going to experience for the next, I don't know, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years is going to be very different than what it will, ex it will experience in, say, 100 years, right? They're doing a good job here of trying to stake and control runoff and erosion in and around the stream while those plants build up because they've removed all of those plants. But those plants that will grow first will tend to be small. They will probably be grasses, and it will take a long time before large trees establish. So stream temperature is also going to be closely tied to the land that it is in and occurs in. One of the other things I mentioned is that we have a number of organisms which significantly modify stream temperatures. And especially in North America, we can think about beavers. Beavers are enormously important uh, for the for modifications of waterways and less so today than they have been in the past because of the sheer amount of trapping that occurs. But beaver numbers are probably at least back on the rise and they certainly are, are far more numerous than they were when the demand for beaver hats was, was in fashion. These are not the only example, but beavers make and construct and maintain enormous numbers of dams all along rivers and that creates huge differences in temperature. It's going to allow surfaces like this to be warmed, right? And it vastly increases the surface area that's available to warm. And in addition to that, water is going to tend to seep out through the bottom. So it's going to tend to allow the surface to warm and still allow cool water to come out. So you can have really abrupt changes. So if you measure the temperature right here, and then you come down here and measure the temperature, right? Just in the course of, of a few feet, I should say meters. I shouldn't even pretend like the English system is a good system. And a few meters, you'll have very drastic, potentially very drastic changes in temperature. And beavers, again, were very, very, very common at one point on this on uh, North American landscape. And these are not the only organisms which modify the landscape. Uh, there's plenty of other organisms which do too. A number of large animals like moose also modify systems. The other one, if you go further south, are things like nutria and muskrats. And we are going to talk about mammals as a group of organisms that modify streams later in this course. But I do want you to be aware that things like temperature can be profoundly impacted by their behaviors and modifications. The other thing that this returns us to is we have to think about, again, things like urbanization and the way that humans modify streams. It should be obvious at this point that if you have a farm field and you do things like clear off a bunch of trees or and you remove a lot of the cover that the stream temperature will change. But let's think about how urbanization is going to also modify stream temperatures. Take a look at this stream here. There's a bunch of stuff that this urbanized stream has is responding to now and the temperature is going to respond to it differently. One of those things is there are big concrete slabs. Big concrete slabs like this are going to change the way in which light is absorbed in the system. And because of that, they're going to change temperature, right? So the way in which this system operates is going to be very, very different than what it does uh, when there isn't big concrete slab there. In addition to that, these, this stream doesn't really have, or I should say the riparian zone is pretty pathetic, right? It basically doesn't allow any sort of transition at either is inside this tunnel or this, this uh, raceway, or it's not. And because of that, it will tend to have very high velocities. So the variability in velocity will be pretty substantial. And it will tend to be very shallow for long periods of time, which means that it's going to tend to heat very substantially. There's not going to be much water and it's going to heat. But at the same time, when there is even a, a, a small amount of water added to the system and the water level jumps up, the temperature is going to decline very rapidly. So you're going to get huge variability in temperatures. You're going to tend to have very high temperatures when temperatures are high, and you're going to have very abrupt shifts to lower temperature. You're going to have the ability to warm much, much faster than you normally would because you're adding a lot of surfaces that reflect and, re and, and return light back into the system as well. Okay. In addition to that, we're also usually speeding up things, right? Putting in all this armored surface here, right? Things like concrete. We're speeding up that river and we're changing the way in which uh, that temperature is moved around or through the system because that water is going to be heated up and then shunted downstream very, very quickly. A couple of things I want you to think about. Groundwater 
which is, of course, the water that is subsurface, is cold. And you can see here that it's predictably cold, right? It's colder than the surface water in most cases. Now, I don't know that you could truly say, let's say down here at the tip of Florida, that 77 is cold water, right? That's not really cold. But I will point out that it's colder than probably the surface water in the same place. But for us in Maryland, you can see that if you drill down into your groundwater, you're going to be in the order of 50 degrees-ish. And I know this is not metric. I apologize for that. But again, this is U.S. data, so it frequently is reported in Fahrenheit. But say on the order of the 20 centigrade, 15 to 20 centigrade range, that's quite cool. But it's consistent. And that means that at certain times of the year, it may actually be a little bit warmer than the surface waters, right? It will take longer for that to cool down. So groundwater is usually colder. Spring, fall, and summer will tend to be colder. But in the winter, it may be a slightly warmer area. So organisms get near to the bottom of streams may be able to find water that's slightly warmer than they are in the stream body itself. This is a pretty variable thing, of course, in that groundwater's access to a stream is, is varies between locations in a stream, between the way in which a stream has been developed, between ways in which the, the stream exposes or doesn't expose groundwater easily. So even if you are an organism that, let's say, could survive in a region and you know the groundwater is sufficient, and there are places where there are ground, there's groundwater access, there may only be groundwater seeps in a certain area. And so those organisms may have to accumulate there, say in the winter time, if they need to survive through stretches where the stream gets too cold for them. I was going to put this in, so see, I still have my, I still want you to find these. You would have been able to do this. But if you, we were out sampling, uh, you would be able to, to play around in a stream and see if you could find a groundwater seep just by having the temperature change abruptly. The other thing to think about with reference to temperature and how it is changed in a stream is substrate, right? There's lots of different shapes and sizes. Shapes that are nice and flat and dark, like you see here, are going to be very good at absorbing heat. And that ab absorption, or it's absorption of sunlight and, and therefore the generation of, of heat and the raising of temperature, that's going to change as things lay on top of them, right? Things like leaves will have a different incidence of, of absorption. So that that surface will change throughout the year. Bright surfaces, though, are going to tend to reflect light. Bright white is going to tend to push that light uh, back out, right? It's going to bounce off and just reflect away. So organisms can take advantage of this too, right? You could end up in a location where it tends to be a darker substrate that will tend to warm faster, or you might want to go to an area that's a lighter substrate. It will tend to be a little bit cooler. This is uh, the reason that there's reflection, right? I do want you to understand this, is that light can be treated as like a little line, a vector in a sense. And when it, it strikes a white surface, it deflects away from that. It actually bounces off, literally bounces away like a bouncy ball. When it, it strikes a dark surface, it tends to be fully absorbed such that all of that light strikes and is absorbed. And because it's energy, Right, that energy has to be released back out into the system. Substrate is highly variable. It changes between streams and area streams and even between uh, rocks. Sometimes it may be fully organic, as in the sense here where there's just leaves. Sometimes there may be something that covers it. Sometimes it may be an inorganic substrate. Frequently it has algae on it, like here, uh, that absorbs heat because it's, it's picking up a lot of those photons. Sometimes it is constantly shifting in bright and a light color. Sometimes it's large and doesn't move very much and it's a dark color. Sometimes it's all of these things, right? Sometimes it depends on the angle that something's in. So there's a lot of ways in which substrate can contribute to the temperature of streams. All right, so what might we think about for take homes? There are a number of factors which can affect stream temperature. Okay, that's, that is obvious. Stream temperature can be variable at very many levels, if it's at the small and at the large scale. Stream temperature within a stream, though, is often better mixed, and so it tends to be relatively stable, especially in natural streams over the course of, say, a day, although this is variable. Things like rain can change that. 
because these systems are so sensitive to many factors and many of these things are the things that we interact with humans can have profound impacts on streams so a lot of this let's think about plants and their ability to shade or not shade a stream humans can have enormous impacts on the way that streams heat and cool simply by removing trees in and around that stream all right next up now that we've covered some of the ways in which temperature is variable in streams we'll talk about light <laughs>